Well, hello, Walden Church. I hope you've all had a terrific summer so far. Uh, this summer, here at the church, we've been looking at the phrase, out with the old and in with the new. And the first week we said, we need to throw out being judgmental because we are all sinners. We are all a mess, right? Second week, we said, we need to throw out the idea that we can just simply save ourselves. Jesus called his disciples to follow him, and he is the only way out of the mess. The third week, we said we had to throw out the idea that we could use our freedom to sin more and more because, you know, God will just forgive us. And we said that a mature Christian, someone who's growing in their faith, should be growing in their faith, right? Someone should, they should you should be becoming more mature. There should be markers of your maturity. And then the fourth week, we said we had to throw out the idea that we can be complacent, that we can just sit there. Jesus said to show compassion to the one who is beaten on the side of the road. Compassion demonstrates our faith. And he said, do this and you will live. But the complete saying, right, is out with the old and in with the new. So we need new, right? For instance, I need a new fence at my house. Uh, my old fence is falling apart right now. I'm taking quotes for a fence, but I'm not going to tear my fence down unless I know there's a new one coming. So we can't just say out with the old. We need to replace it with new. Well, good news. Jesus came and he brought a whole bunch of new. He brought a new commandment. He brought a new covenant. He brought us a whole new set of marching orders. And he said he was going to accomplish it all in a brand new way. This new thing he called the church. Not a temple, not a gold building with a high ceilings and an altar. This new thing he was calling the church. And so as you sit there right now at home watching us, know that you are a new thing. You are a new thing. Jesus changed the old covenant. He redefined the commandments. He set up a new way of worshiping that he calls spirit and truth. And he modeled how to do it every single day he was here. In Jesus, there are no sacred places. There's no sacred men who keep all the secrets and that they're the only ones who are allowed to read the sacred books. The old model said that only certain people could do it. Only certain people could worship the right way. It wasn't open to everyone. No, there was these, there was these sacred men and they were holy. And only the sacred men were righteous. And we should all be like them. But when Jesus came, he raised the bar even higher. And he said, there are no holy people. You are all sinners. He removed the hierarchy. And he said, no, we, we all fall short. People were looking up to the Pharisees and Jesus said, I want, I want your righteousness to exceed the Pharisees. Jesus brought a brand new thing. In Jesus... There are no sacrifices. Instead, he said, I bring a new covenant. And that was the cross. No longer did we need to appease God. We need to avert his wrath by killing an animal. No longer did we need to earn God's favor through various acts or works. Jesus said it was impossible. He said, it is so impossible, I'm going to do it for you. And through an act of grace, he was our last high priest, and he was our last sacrifice. In Jesus, there are no long set of rules. Instead, he said, I bring a new commandment. And that was a statement that we should love each other. In fact, he said you could take the huge book of the Bible, you know, all, all those pages, all those thousands of words, all those stories, all those authors, all those teaching, and he said you could summarize it. You could summarize all of it down to a sentence, love God and love each other. If we are his church today, right? If we are his church, we are called to be this new thing. We talked about Paul last week. When he was young, he tried to single-handedly destroy the church and he had the means and the power to do it. And he could have done it, but Jesus stopped him. 
And so Paul understood, out of anyone who lived back then, he understood that you couldn't just take old Jewish practices and lay them on top of this new thing that Jesus was doing. That wasn't going to work. On one of his mission trips, he went to a place called Galatia, which today for us is Turkey. And he helps plant a couple churches there. And after he leaves, Jewish Christian missionaries, they come and they start preaching to the Gentile people in Galatia. And they said, whoa, 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 you can't become a Christian yet. See, Jesus was Jewish, right? And if you're worshiping Jesus first, you need to be Jewish. Then you can become Christian. It's out with the old, in with the new, right? And they said, yes, but you can't experience the new until you first experience the old. It kind of sounds like it would make sense, but it was wrong. Paul called them the Judaizers, and they wanted you to be all in, all in, which means for Gentile men back then, that required painful surgery. I'm not going to say any more. I'm sure we're all on the same page. Don't make me say it. <laughs> and when Paul heard about this, he was mad, right? Did you, know, did you know Paul got mad? He said, you can't blend the two together. You can't mix old and new together. That goes against everything Jesus set up. So he writes them a letter to correct this incorrectness. And he says in chapter five, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith worked through love. Paul says, in Jesus, you now have freedom. And so Jesus' church is about freedom. And if it's not about freedom, then it's going in the wrong direction. And then Paul writes in all caps, and he says, look, I, Paul, say this. This is me. You know, he says, if you embrace circumcision, you are embracing the old covenant. And if you are embracing the old covenant, then you're obligated to do all of it. He says, this isn't that. Don't abandon the new to embrace the old. He says, those outward practices, those temple practices, they are about old law. No wearing of mixed fabrics. No, you have to wear a head covering. No more eating shellfish. No more eating bacon. He says, if you're, if you're trying to get right with God by going backwards, he says, then you've fallen away from grace. What does that mean? Well, can you imagine if somebody gave you a, a birthday present, right? And, and it was so great, so great that you felt guilty receiving it. So you got out your checkbook and you paid them back for it. You wouldn't do that, would you? No, because once you do that, it's no longer a gift. You've cheapened the moment. You've ruined the gift and the gift giver. And Paul says, if you are trying to earn grace through temple worship, then you are throwing grace away. And he says, point blank, unless we would have any doubt about this, he says, circumcision counts for nothing. Nothing. It's part of the Old Covenant. It's an Old Covenant marker. It means nothing. Look at that. Jesus changed everything. Don't you see? Jesus changed everything. He made all things new. Last week, we said he changed Passover. And here, Paul says the only thing that counts is Jesus and our faith expressing it through love. So Jesus changed Passover and circumcision. For Jewish people, this is not a small change. This is not a slight diversion. This is not tasting the soup and then adding more salt. This is taking the soup and throwing it away and starting over. Paul says circumcision is nothing 
because the only thing that matters is love. And that statement is still hard for a lot of people to believe. Paul says, for Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. I didn't say this. This is not me up here talking. I'm just reading the words that are on the page. This is Paul, right? And this is the big Bible. Your Bible is a big book. And there's a lot of words in there. And Paul says, I can, I can summarize it. I can make it super easy to understand. It's faith working itself out through love. Paul says, old temple practices go away with the old covenant. The only thing that matters now in Jesus' church is working your faith out through love. Love is more important than buildings. Love is more important than practices. Even Jesus told us, John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Ladies and gentlemen, the 11th commandment, right? Jesus said it's new and it's how he wants his church to be known. Well, but shouldn't we also love God? I mean, we should spend our time loving God. Of course, of course you should spend your time loving God, but he's our parent. He's not gonna stop loving us. His love is unconditional. His love is all-encompassing. God's love is eternal. God's love is perfect. And he already loves you. And let me tell you something that's probably really going to blow your mind. God loves you even if you don't love him back. God loves you even if you don't believe in him. See... The old temple model was already being practiced by every single other pagan faith. Pagan religion says, bring your sacrifice to the temple and pay your respects to God, because if you mess up, God is angry with you. But Jesus said his new church would be known as a group of people who love each other. That when they gather together, they love each other. They pray for each other. They help their neighborhood. They help their community. They lift each other up. And that was a new way to do religion. And because it was a new way, it's no wonder the Galatians fell back into old practices, especially when someone told them they were doing it wrong. Paul says to the Galatian church, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view. And the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would just emasculate themselves. Paul says... You were doing so well. You were doing so, so well. Who trips you up? Because when you add just a little bit of the wrong thing, you can mess it all up. Just a little bit of temple worship. Just a little bit of legalism. That's all it takes to mess everything up. Can you see how worked up Paul is? Look at this. He says, those people that preach that false message to you, those people that took you away from Jesus, those people who led you back to the old way, what does he say? He says, I wish those people would just... Again, I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> it's the rated R part of the Bible. But this is how angry Paul is. This sentence is actually in your Bible from Paul. He said, people who try to add just a little bit of old in with the new, I wish they would hurt themselves rather than hurt Christ's church. Because the old has no place in this new thing that Jesus calls church. Because what happens when you start going back to temple worship? Leaders become self-righteous. This is bad. Because it brings all the rules down low. Jesus set the rules high. He said, don't commit adultery. And the leaders back then said, I haven't. 
But Jesus says, yes, but if you lust after another woman, it's exactly the same. And he raised the bar. Jesus said, don't murder. The leaders back then said, I haven't. And he says, yes, but if you hate another person, it's exactly the same thing. Jesus raised the bar. Jesus set the rules high and thus leveled the playing field so that everyone would be on equal footing. And this is where we are all treated fairly and so that people would not be mistreated. People would not be abused or persecuted. Tell me something. Have you or someone you know been mistreated by the church? Of course. Statistics say that only 32% of Americans go to church regularly. What about the rest of the people? Do you think they all stopped coming because they were just loved too much or judged too much? Listen, there is something we have to throw out. We have to stop judging sinners. They need to be here, right? They need to be here with us not out there getting the wrong message force-fed to them. Jesus didn't tell us to judge. He didn't tell us to gatekeep. He told us to love. That is job one. He said, be known for that. Be known for love. Jesus said in his new church, there would be no self-righteous people. That's why he always butted head with the Pharisees. They made religion about them. They said, be like us. In Jesus' new church, we don't point to a pastor. Don't point to me. Please, I am a sinner just like you. In Jesus' new church, we point to Jesus because we all want to be like Jesus. What did Jesus do? He loved God and loved others. And watch, Paul says those exact same words next. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul agrees with Jesus, doesn't he? Paul agrees with the great commandment. Yes, you are free from death and free from punishment. Last week we said Jesus changed punishment, but we don't use our freedom to indulge ourselves. Rather, we use our freedom to take off our priestly robes and wrap a towel around our waist and serve one another. This is Jesus' new church. Love God, love others. Well, how do I love God? You love God by loving your neighbor. Galatians 5, 6 says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything. So, what does count? Right? If he's telling you out with the old, you want to know, okay, what counts? What's in with the new? And he says, only faith working through love. Only. Paul says only that. Why only that? Because when things are right with the people in your life, when things are right, with those around you, when things are right with your brother and sister, then things are right with God. Tell me, how different would the world be if we all agreed that the most important thing as Christians, as Americans, as neighbors, was to love the people around us? How different would the world be? Let's all pray. Let's all pray that our love may abound more and more because that is what is important to God. Last week I asked, what is church? Right? I said, what is church? What is this, what is this new thing of Jesus? And I'm sure that answer changes depending on who you ask. Probably changes depending on your denomination. It changes depending on your faith or if you have faith. But the Bible says love defines church. Love defines church. 
That means there's only one thing that defines us as a church. It's not the fact that we meet together on Sundays or Saturdays. It's not the fact that we sing hymns or choruses. It's not robes or suits. It's not pews. It's not chairs. It's not even the fact that we read the Bible. The only thing that defines us as a church, as the body of Christ, is our love for God and our love for each other. 1 John 4 says we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. It's right there. It's right there. God is love. And notice it doesn't say God loves. It doesn't say God loves, which is an action verb, right? But that God is love. In other words, it is not one of God's activities. <laughs> love is who he is. And one of the most important things that you'll ever learn in this life is that God never stops loving you. Peter denied being one of the disciples, but God still loved him and turned his life around. Mark turned back and quit in the middle of a missionary journey, but Christ still loved him and he caused him to be instrumental to the church and he helped Paul. King David committed adultery, coveted, and murdered. He broke 30% of the commandments in one act, but God still forgave him and loved him. Max Lucado writes, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. And if he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring and a sunrise every morning. Whenever you want to talk, he will listen. He could have chosen to live anywhere, in any building, in the universe. And he chose your heart because he's crazy about you. And so our love for one another becomes a witness of his love for us. And if we can take that love that God has for us, a love that was ultimately demonstrated by Jesus Christ coming into the world and being the, the last sacrifice that we might be given eternal life, if we can take that kind of sacrificial love and then demonstrate it for each other, it becomes the greatest form of evangelism that the church or the world will ever see. D.L. Moody wrote, show me a church where there is love and I will show you a church that is a power in the community. If you want to know how closely you are following Jesus, look at your love life. Look at how you are loving others. If you want to know how closely you are following Jesus as a church, look at our love life. Look at how we are loving our neighbors. When the church of Jesus demonstrates that kind, that kind of unconditional, sacrificial love to their neighbors, his kingdom will grow. His name will be worshipped. What is a church? What is a church? Is it a place for the religious and the ceremonial? Is it a place for history and tradition? Is it a place for socializing and gathering together in groups? Or is it a place where the love of God is known? Where the love of God is experienced? where the love of God is expressed. First John 4 says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Let's all experience this brand new thing. Let's demonstrate this brand new thing. If we can show the world church, the church Jesus had in mind, 
a church of service, a church of compassion, a church working its faith out through love. Let's pray. Father God, in the busy world, it's very easy for us to make it all about us. We come here to worship, to confess our sins, and to say that next week we'll try harder, to buckle down, to make promises. We keep worrying that our relationship with you falters, and yet your word tells us time and time again that we are forgiven and that we are loved and accepted. We are the son who returns each time repentant, and yet you run to meet us. Please, may we learn this lesson, that we should take that same energy the energy where we worry about ourselves and our standing with you, if we can take that focus and redirect it to our neighbor. There's no steps, no direction, other than just to love. It can start with our speech, how we talk about others. It can start with our humor and the jokes we tell. It can move into our actions. We can begin to pray with strangers, shake hands more, make eye contact, smile more, embrace more, hug more, You can move to acts of service, using our talents and gifts to help each other, to see a need and to fill it, to demonstrate your love and grace to a world that is hurting right now, a world that is asking to be seen, a world that is asking to be loved. Here we are, your church. We should be the first ones in line to hold and to receive, to love and to show compassion. We should be out there with arms raised, saying, here I am, Lord, send me. If there is love, that needs to be shared, love that needs to be experienced, love that needs to be modeled. Send your church. Send your church. Lord, make your church new. Make your church new. Amen. I want you to experience the newness of church and I want you to take this message to your church and I want you to be adamant that this is how the church should be, a place of love for everyone, for all people because we're all a mess. We're all sinners. We all have our issues and our darkness and our shadows that follow us. We have to stop creating division. Stop looking for ways that we are diverse and ways that we disagree and start looking for ways that we can hold hands and walk across the room and meet Jesus wants his kingdom to grow. 
And he gave us a brand new thing the world had never seen. Let's stop going back to old and embrace new. Go find your local church and plug in and serve and love. See you next week.